Aloha, and welcome back to The Creative Life from the American Creativity Association's Austin Global Chapter on ThinkTech Hawaii, a streaming network series. I'm your host, Phyllis Blees, and joining me today is our guest, Shaku Salvakumar, and she is talking about answering the call of the creative quest by using the alchemy of the heart. Shaku is a poet, an author, and a communications leader with multinational and startup experience with Fortune 500 companies like IBM, Shell Oil, and AI tech startup companies. So she's used her skills and her vision and her poetry in service to helping others become better leaders and more intuitive and more in touch with themselves. Shaku, I want to welcome you with a big aloha to be on the show. Aloha, Phyllis. Thank you so much for having me on this show. This is wonderful to be here. Well, it's wonderful to have you. You and I go quite a few years back now, and uh, I am so thrilled that you're bringing us something that we've not talked about on the show before in terms of this answering the call of a creative quest. And in doing that, I, I just, maybe we could open with your giving us your definition of creativity. So, you know, whenever, uh, whenever anyone has to define something that is so ancient, uh, it, you, you always feel like you need to, uh, tread with a little bit of care and humility because um, creativity is the source of life. It is uh, all life springs from it, it is the it's the way that we move forward and and that that the the there are two there are two ways that are uh, that we progress and one is uh, one is the cyclical way of creativity and the other is is that creativity that is, is purely tapping into inspiration which is actually that place of divinity and uh and when when we talk about creativity we also sometimes tend to feel that one person is more creative than the other person or creativity is defined in a particular output but that is not the case. Anytime we pour our heart into any project, um, any undertaking, that is, that is proof that our creativity is blooming within us. And when we don't um, recognize creativity in, in, um, in, in the East, I'm, I'm from India, when uh, we don't recognize creativity. We actually believe that we are we are dishonoring the 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 muse, the goddess herself. Mm -hmm. So that is that is why when we don't recognize, we don't understand, we don't uh, honor. That's why we feel uh, small. We, we feel like we need to move into the external sphere of validation rather than understanding that this is absolutely the source itself. This is boundless. This is flowing. Uh, Saraswati, the goddess of creativity in India, she's the river. She is always flowing. Um, so that is the, that's how I see creativity. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I'd like to come back and touch on a few points because you said if you don't, if you don't really come fully from the heart, you're not accessing creativity. And I want to put on, I want to put in the kind of in the, in the, uh, the waiting room, what it's like when people are drawing on creativity as the mother of invent, the necessity being the mother of invention and when they're desperate. And the last thing they're thinking about is their heart call, but they're thinking about survival. And, and, it, and maybe that's something you're going to unpack for us 
because there might be different levels of answering the call or the quest to accessing our creativity. Maybe we're, you know, why don't you speak to that? And before we get to the byline of what the alchemy of the heart, or maybe we're ready for that, but not and so much, but, but I do, I do think that there's a spontaneity. There's a, there could be crisis. There can be anything but feeling like you're accessing your heart uh, when you're rising to a quest, but to the call for survival, those kinds of things. So talk to me a little bit about your statement to me at one point was that creativity is a quest to find proof that life exists beyond the obvious. So I don't want to hold you to that, but can you talk a little bit still about framing what creativity is and how we get it to being a quest? Yes. Or not. Yeah. So what um what happens is we um we forget that our that life is cyclical that we forget that we because we are used to the the fact that time because we consider time as a linear uh, as a linear force we we seem to we actually look at everything in a in, in chronology but the the fact is that life itself is searching for uh, for meaning. All life searches for meaning, and and when we when we embark on the creative quest, we are actually we are actually reaffirming to ourselves that we matter, that we exist, that we might be uh, um, a speck of dust in the whole scheme of things, but that dust matters. So when you look at your life as proof of existence, and in even in its smallness, it encompasses expansion and magnitude and that and it creates a ripple effect. Every life impacts other lives. And there's no life that is inconsequential. When we understand that, that we are both, when we understand the paradox and the polarity of our life, that we can be small, but we're not insignificant. Mm. We, and, uh, and we understand that we, that we are not also, we, uh, we look into the hubris of believing that we are the center of all existence. We are not. So that whole understanding that each of us matter, that each of us have come to this world to give something back to the world, then we understand that our, we learn how to recognize what our creativity is and we tap into our gifts. And the way we serve is we tap into that potential, the promise of our lives, and that's the gift we give back to the world. So in giving the gift back to the world, we're actually gifting ourselves. So that's the whole premise, my premise of creativity. It's not, it's not, it's not some beautiful word that you, you know, stick on a poster and put it on a wall. It is something that we live. We, we owe it to ourselves and to our world to live up to the promise that we bring to life. You know, we just haven't had this particular conversation on this show, and I am very drawn in to your view of creativity. It, it, it feels like a partner. It feels like, a ha like you said, light calls on us. So you, you're, you're personifying life apart from us. And that it has its own presence. And are you saying we're, we presence it and your, in your experience and worldview through our heart? And when we're discon... So I'm dr drawing some broad conclusions. When we're disconnected from our heart, 
then we're disconnected from, we can be disconnected from our, the most vital source of our creativity, not exigent creativity, but the well of creativity. I guess, I guess there could be differences, you know, creativity in the moment not to fall off a cliff is a kind of creativity that's exigent. Whereas I, what I'm getting from you is there's a wellspring here that you're going to help us tap into that is life-giving, not Absolutely. just not just an emergency, you know, like our emergency life vest. You're talking about a life-giving well that's and endless and and boundless and timeless. When Absolutely. you talk about Kairos instead of Kronos, yes. So. Talk to us about this wellspring. What does he mean by alchemy of the heart? What does the heart have to do with it? And how do we d interact? You, you, you know, Phyllis, when I was, uh, um, you know, I, I, this whole journey with my poetry has been the jour a journey of my heart because what, what I discovered was that this, the, the heart is such a magnificent generator. But if you look at the languaging around the heart, you know, look at all the, um, the uh, illnesses that we come up in, in common language. You know, you have heart attacks, you have heart strokes, you have, uh, you have um, angina, you have, uh, um, you have um, so many blockages. And what are these? What are these uh, in uh, relation to? They're actually in relation to our heart harboring guilt and shame and regret and blame. And these these emotions they hold our heart from from actually accessing our life force. And when the heart is not open to access that life force. Creativity is stifled, and and you will see that there are different forms of creativity. There, there, there is actually darker creativity, which which exists in in the um, in the enraged heart, in the suppressed heart, in the small heart, and then there is this magnificent uh, channel that opens as you open your heart. The, the channel that opens up to you is boundless. It's expansive. It is, that is when you understand that this, this, the seat of the heart is, is the seat of Atma, is the seat, is the lotus. When the lotus blooms in the heart, that's when the golden heart awakens. And when the golden heart awakes, awakens in us, you will see it in that person they are no longer triggered by every little thing. I'm not saying that suddenly we wake up and we're not bothered by anything and then we're just, you know, someone someone cuts into the lane or, <laughs> or you know, uh, uh, hurts us in any way that we don't react. We will. that Those things will happen. But you will find that you're able to heal faster and faster and faster and you're not going to be hoarding you're not going to be hoarding all that negativity in you, and have, because any any time we hold that anything we any time we hold anything heavy, those are literally the analogy of putting rocks into our heart, which which is why we we start finding our um, we start finding that heaviness. And and a, and a heartbreak is real. Heartbreak is real. So much of our grief has to be worked through. Otherwise, that heart is never. Um, you you know that beautiful analogy, kinsuki, which is which is mending all of life's failures and lessons and pain and everything with the gold, and that's the alchemy, the gold that we use to mend our heart, to heal our heart is the alchemy because what then emerges from that is another piece of ecstatic heart that is a work of art. So that's 
So we can actually create from our own brokenness. Okay. I want, I want to hold, I want to hold a minute because you've come, you've taken this through a bit of a journey, different heart journeys where we're afraid where, and, and you is the poet that you are. We have a slide on this. You've used the alchemy of language to bring out this aha for me. When you talked about, you talked about the golden heart. You've also talked about the sacred heart, which is a very huge symbol in the Christian tradition uh and 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 you shifted the word moving from the scared heart to the sacred heart and yet so you're now we need still need to tell the audience how we do this so we're talking about don't do it but t talk a little bit about what's here and what we're seeing and why we why you put that slide in so um we right now with the with the kind of chaos that we're facing in the world no. there the the predominant emotion is fear and that fear is constantly um is constantly at our door and and that fear is real there's no way we can go to someone who's actually facing financial problems who's who's uh, who's uh, impacted by climate uh, 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 climate disorders at their doorstep, who's, uh, who's, ha who's in the middle of a relationship uh, um, problem. There's no way we can go and say, don't be afraid. You know, the fear is as, um, fear is actually hardwired in our genetic makeup. So you cannot actually, and fear is also an, is important for survival. But when you're constantly only operating from being scared, then what happens is you are afraid to even step out of the house. You're afraid that you're, you're afraid of death. And that death comes in different guises. That death could be the death of your identity. That death could be the death of uh, a, a physical death. That could be that could be the death of someone you love very much or the loss. So that place of fear, it it rests so uh, heavily within us that we are unable to understand that there is something that is bigger in in store for us. That is the sacred. When you understand, when you move, when you shift from scared to sacred, you're actually allowing yourself to to co-create with the divine. Okay, you're you're then walking in faith and trust. Okay, you need so, both. So let's look at the next slide and talk talk us through a little bit this alchemy of the heart that you have develop a process and an understanding about to, right. to get moved. What are we seeing here? So um, this, the alchemy of the heart, this, this particular piece was inspired by the elements. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, all time animated shows is Avatar, the, uh, the airbender. I just love the way they, they, take this wisdom right to its essence. And when you look at fire, you look at the energy of fire, if it is then, if it is, if we're operating from the scared vision of fire, then we are constantly in reactive mode. We are reacting to everything because that's what fire does. It just goes up in flames. It, it burns everything down. But if Looking at uh, if we are balanced, then you're working at fire from the sacred fire. We need sacred fire because sacred fire is a source of vitality. That is Agni, right? And it's same with earth. If you are too rigid in, in, in its rigid state, you will not change your mind. You will not open up to anything that is beyond the normal. You're you're fixated. You're in. You want. You have control issues. You cannot let go because control is maintaining some sort of order. At least you think you are. But positive earth is 
is groundedness. It gives you that stability. It gives you the ability to uh, to make decisions knowing that you have the ground, right? You, you are in that. The same with water. If water is moody, it's emotional. It is. Uh, it it uh, it it can just uh, plumb you to the depths. But water, like I said earlier, is the flow of the goddess. It is. Uh, it is actually connectivity. It is you and me talking here. It's uh, it's that having that ability to connect and um, maintain those essential relationships. And then finally, if you look at air, air, disordered air is actually where we are, where in social media, where there's so much going on, we're just, we're, we're, we're not even thinking through, we're distracted. But air is actually inspiration. It's prana. It is, it is holy air, which if you look at the quality of air, we are all breathing the same air. Mm -hmm. And we're all uh, drinking that same water. Mm -hmm. It's coming from, and, and we all, so this connection is what we have to understand that uh, the element of sacred versus scared. All right. So I'm going to ask you, we have a, we can show the slide or I know it was too soon. I, I'm skipping something. Uh, I wanted to talk about your book of poetry. Uh, is the next slide. So that's going to be the quest on how we become our own avatars, our own yes. bender. So our own airbender, waterbender, firebender. I mean, the kids are going to love that you're using this as a model, but t walk us through this quest. How do we how do we enter into this circle? So, like I like we started, uh, the quest is um, to find proof of life. It the quest is to re-energize us, and and we have to understand that a lot of times there are there there is a part of us that is dormant, that goes dormant because we actually follow the 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 seasons of life, right? You. Uh, when it's when it's fall, you have to harvest. You cannot plant uh, certain uh, things in fall because that's the time to harvest. When it's winter, you have to retreat. The reason we have to retreat is so that we can be we can you know right now it's uh, it's I can see spring starting to emerge and it's it's because it's timing. The quest is actually uh, in line with our own divine timing, right? And the and for a student heading off to college, someone getting married, you know, being an empty nester, uh, in the uh, the the Hindu uh, philosophy has the four stages of life. When you're a student, you have certain responsibilities. When you are a householder, you have certain responsibilities. In fact, a lot of times they say when you're a householder, do not you cannot just abandon your home and go off. Uh, to the mountains because there are certain commitments and the same when you are in this an empty nester then you start you you move into your second period of creativity because now you're actually operating from a different sense of sacred what has been emptied from the nest can now be filled with different kinds of eggs those are your the eggs that you're birthing into the second half of life mm. and, and then finally towards the end you you have to slow down you cannot operate at that same manic pace and the quest actually takes you through the questions of who am i what is my timing what do i believe the what do i believe is very important because if we do not understand what we believe intrinsically every share every viral post every meme is going to just knock us off and take us into a different direction and i just want to say that this is i was reading this article by mark lee robinson and he talks about the four areas right one is personal my physical presence who am i personally my personality the next one is interpersonal what is my relationship with others how do i show up with others the third is intrapersonal. Intrapersonal is what is my inner 
life. How do I define my inter- inner life? The, the fourth is the transpersonal. What is my belief about the cosmos, about the world? And we need to understand where we are in resonance and where we are in dissonance in these four areas. Okay, I'm going to hold our request. And hold that thought. If we've just got a few minutes left, I was wondering if we wanted, I want to show the next slide of the book of poetry, Be Still My Heart, that you have written and that you've drawn all the illustrations for. I love it. I have it next to where I read every morning. Uh, and do my meditation. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't know if there is any poem in there that illustrates any one of these points, uh, or would we, it, or or not, because you've only got thirty seconds. <laughs> I think I think not. Right? There isn't like a haiku in there or something. I I think this would be done, which is just basically it's. The best is not yet to come. It is not a place in the future or a memory languishing in the past. It is not a trade with the present or born in fair weather or a dream in fetter. It is not waiting for planets to align, deferred for an auspicious time when your ship can finally sail. It is anytime, anyhow, every day, any place, anywhere, everywhere, always. The best is your constant bet on yourself. Oh, I'm so glad you read that. It gives the audience a chance to see how delightful you sh- help us show up. And, and I love your language. And uh, there, there is a, uh, there, you dance with words, Shaku. It's, it's a real joy to read and be with you. Uh, I want the audience to know that we'll have to leave it there and you have a website and you coach and you craft and you dream and you help others through this journey of the alchemy of the heart. So I really want to let people know to take a moment at the end here and stop the video and take your contact information. But for now, we'll have to leave it there. I want to let the audience know that you've been watching The Creative Life on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, I have been discussing how to answer the call of the creative quest through the alchemy of your heart with our guest, Shaku Selva Kumar. And mahalo, Shaku, for joining us. And mahalo to you, our viewers, for tuning in. I'm your host, Phyllis Bleese. And we will be back soon with another edition of The Creative Life. Aloha.